a very warm welcome, everybody. It's uh, wonderful to see you all, and it's a special privilege for me to have the opportunity to introduce a thinker whom I have admired for many years, and uh, uh, for all sorts of reasons. This is Professor, Professor Olivier Boulnois, who is a professor of the École des Pratiques des Hautes Études, which is one of the great uh, grand établissements of France. It's one of the most prestigious research institutions in, in the country. Um, and he's got a, a chair in medieval philosophy and metaphysics. And uh, those of us who've worked in medieval philosophy, uh, of the, the history of aesthetics, uh, uh, liberalism and the history of liberty will, will know uh, what a titan Prof Professor Boulnois is uh, in those respective fields. That's quite extraordinary how he managed, manages to shuttle across those different, uh, those different boundaries. Uh, so it's a great privilege to have him back uh, for this, the fourth of his Stanton lectures. Professor, over to you. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. We already saw that Paul's thought was oriented by the expectation of the parousia in lecture two. We also saw that it was necessary to live in this world as not living in it, according to the overlap of two radically distinct points of view, the point of view of the world and the point of view of God in lecture three. Today, our reflection on Paul's ethics must, in a second step, pass through a hermeneutical detour. What place does Paul occupy in the history of ethics. Nietzsche, in his paragraph 68 of Daybreak, paints a vitriolic portrait of Paul. I quote, if one had read, really read, the writings of St. Paul as a philologist, Christianity would soon have had its day. So well do the pages of this Jewish Pascal lay bare the origins of Christianity. He suffered from a fixed idea, or more precisely, a fixed question. What was the Jewish law, and above all, the fulfillment of this law? So for Nietzsche, as a good Pharisee, Paul wanted to assert his desire for distinction, his will to power, by becoming the fanatical defender of the Torah. I quote once more, and behold, he felt in his own person that he himself was unable to fulfill the law. And it was not rather the law itself that must prove its impracticality over and over again and push towards transgression through an irresistible charm. It's a question by Nietzsche. And at the end, he was enlightened by a vision. To him, the furious zealot of the law, Jesus appeared on a deserted road. Everything suddenly became clear in his head. Here is the outcome. Here is the full revenge that I hold, the destroyer of the law. So Nietzsche proposes his genealogy of Christianity. It is born from within Judaism, but, has, but as a negation of the Jewish law. And this negation is based on the psychology of Paul. Paul is the first Christian because by putting an end to the Torah, he founds Christianity as we know it. For according to Nietzsche, the law is born out of the will of power. <clears throat> of the will to power, excuse me, because the law has high demands. The will must rise ev ever higher to fulfill it. But Paul discovers that he himself is incapable of fulfilling it, that he is constantly tempted to transgress, to transgress it. The law keeps him in the torture of non-fulfillment. In Paul, the will is incapable of asserting itself it turns into resentment against that which reveals its powerlessness. It turns into a negation of the law. Therefore, Paul's conversion is a particular case of the revenge of the weak 
of turning the will to power against itself. It amounts to denying the law, the limits which make the will stronger. So we find a tripal critique. Religious, Paul betrays the gospel and gives power to the priestly caste. Metaphysical, Paul founds an asceticism, an asceticism that is the essence of Schopenhauerian pessimism, the negation of the will to power. And finally, moral, Paul supports the values of weakness and renunciation. Here, Nietzsche takes three theses for granted. One, Paul has personally experienced his own powerlessness to act well. Two, the law is experienced by him as a call to transgression. Three, Christianity resolves this contradiction because it destroys the Jewish law and replaces it with God's grace. Yet, Nietzsche's interpretation is based on an impressive projection, for he immediately adds, I quote, Luther probably experienced similar feelings when he wanted to become, in his cloister, the accomplished example of the spiritual ideal. And what happened to Luther, who once began to hate the spiritual ideal, happened also to St. Paul. But if Nietzsche's Luther is so much like Paul, it is in reality because he sees in Paul another Luther. Indeed, Nietzsche depends on a Lutheran Schopenhauerian interpretation. Firstly, Schopenhauerian. According to Schopenhauer, the will is a constraining power and man becomes free only by renouncing the will. The will turns away from life. Man only achieves freedom through self-denial, asceticism, and non-willing. Schopenhauer ident identifies the irresistible will to live with original sin and the abdication of the will with redemption. Thus, it seems to Nietzsche that Paul transforms the powerlessness of his will into a renunciation of will identified with a theory of redemption. The weak accept domination when it is presented as an ideal. Secondly, Lutheran. In an autobiographical passage, Luther described his moral life as, as a powerlessness to satisfy God for his sinful existence from birth, despite his blameless behavior. What freed him from his anguish of guilt was the discovery that righteousness does not come from human acts, but from God who justifies the believer by his grace. Thus, the law appears as the negative moment that, that will lead to a call for the help of, of faith. The only thing that delivers man, I quote Luther, the only thing that delivers man from his sin is faith in Christ. So Luther attributes the same experience to Paul. First, the powerlessness of the will. Then, the law as a torture of non-fulfillment. Finally, the abolition of the law by faith. Therefore, when he ascribes the same experience to Paul, Nietzsche is applying an impeccable Lutheran theology. But more fundamentally, Luther's opposition between faith and works is based on Augustine's famous analysis of grace. For the Bishop of Hippo, man can only fulfill the commandments if God gives him grace. Da quod ubes and ube quod vis. Give me what you command and command what you will. This is a leitmotif of the confessions. Quoting the same text from Paul, the just man lives by faith, Augustine deduces that this is, I quote, a clear proof that no one can be justified by the law. This is for him an argument against Pelagius. For Pelagius, man must strive to do good 
and he will and he will be crowned by divine grace according to his merits. Whereas for Augustine, man cannot even begin to will the good without grace. But is this really the problem? Do these nested interpretations, Augustinian, Lutheran, Nietzschean, these nested interpretations really apply to Paul? Can we return to Paul beneath all his interpreters. We need to question their three main theses. One, when Paul speaks of the powerlessness of the will, is he speaking from personal experience? Two, did Paul argue that the Torah was abolished? Three, is the relationship between Judaism and those who adhere to the Messiah a relationship of negation. This is what we must check, being no less philologists than Nietzsche. So my first point is powerlessness in the first person. Let us begin with the question of the powerlessness of the will. We must read Romans 7, 18, 19. Toga thelane Parakaitai moi. To want is within my reach, but to accomplish what is beautiful, I cannot. For it is not what I want, the good that I do, but what I do not want, the bad that I practice. Here we find a description of the phenomenon known as akrasia, powerlessness. Certainly, Paul does not use this word here but he does deal with the thing so-called by philosophers. Acrasia is the phenomenon whereby an agent knows what is right, but fails to do it. With the Stoics, Acrasia became a matter of the will. Like the Stoics, Paul, pulls, Paul puts the will in the foreground three times. It is the act of wanting that is um, within my reach. It is not what I want that I perform, and it is what I don't want that I do. Hannah Arendt saw in this passage one of the summits of Western reflection on freedom. In Between Past and Future, she underlined that it was necessary to pass through the powerlessness in order to discover the will as power. Let us recall, however, that Stoicism already thought of incontinence or acrasia as powerlessness of the will. According to Epictetus, when man commits a fault, he does not do what he wants. It is exactly the same expression as Paul's, but in the third person singular. So neither Paul nor Christianity discovered the will. Besides, this was not Paul's aim. His focus is about salvation history, not about moral psychology. Unlike Epictetus, however, Paul states this powerlessness in the first person singular. What is the value of this first person? Luther has pointed out that Augustine's interpretation is original. I quote Luther, that the apostle speaks in his own name, the blessed Augustine is the first to assert, to assert it abundantly and constantly in his book against the Pelagians. This remark is perfectly accurate. Before Augustine, most of the Greek and Latin fathers, including the young Augustine, refused to relate this statement to Paul himself. For example, according to Origen, Paul, I quote, introduces a diversity of persons. For he who elsewhere says he is redeemed by Christ, says here he is sold to sin. He who elsewhere asserts Christ lives in him, now proclaims, good does not dwell in me. 
In reality, says Origen, this passage of scripture, I quote, exchanges in a hidden way both persons and situations. Therefore, Paul assumes here and now in himself as a doctor of the church, the role, persona, of the weak. He therefore says of himself, as if speaking for them, I am carnal, sold to sin. He shows that he who speaks in this way nevertheless tries to resist the vices a little, but that he, he is overcome and crushed in spite of himself. End of quotation. This defines incontinence, acrasia. Therefore, in this whole passage, when Paul says I, it is not a confession. He plays the role, persona proponitur. He plays the role of the man under the law or the Jew, knowing the good, but enslaved by sin. Similarly, before the Pelagian quarrel, Augustine considered that Paul says, I, in the place of the man placed under the law before grace. I quote Augustine. He speaks indeed up to this point from the perspective ex persona of the man placed under the law, not yet established under grace, and who, dominated by concupiscence, is certainly impelled to act badly, though he disapproves of this by his knowledge of the law. At first, Augustine admitted that this powerlessness referred to man under the law, not to Paul himself. He left open the possibility that under grace, man could dominate covetousness, exercise his free will, and acquire virtue. But later, Augustine reversed his interpretation for the attribution to Paul of the weakness of the will. For the attribution to Paul of the weakness of the will was a very strong argument against Pelagius. I quote, later on, it's from the Retractationes. Later on, I saw that one could understand in relation to the apostle himself what he says. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. And this is what, in the books I have recently written against the Pelagians, I have carefully, show, carefully shown as far as I could. For Augustine, Pelagius fails to see that man is from birth incapable of doing good, that only grace can liberate free will to enable it to will good, and that even, even under grace, man continues to desire evil. In this new context, Augustine's analysis of the weakness of the will differs from Paul's account. For Augustine places it within a doctrine of soul and body, of free will and consent. Paul, uh, Paul saw a massive, inexplicable and tragic contradiction. I do what I do not want. According to Augustine, if the will commanded, the body would obey. But the will is not capable of commanding the good because it is not capable of wanting it. He thus mitigates the Pauline paradox. According to Augustine, when Paul says, I want, he means, I covet, I covet evil. From then on, this behavior is explicable. All men under grace feel concupiscentia, lust, which comes from the flesh. So what Paul means is not that he was able to do evil, but that he felt covetousness. The power of covetousness is that it escapes our will and produces involuntary movement in the body. This is what defines flesh according to Augustine and um, Paul was in his flesh. This covetousness is the trace of original sin in man's nature and the sting that tempts him. This is why all human existence is a temptation. So 
Augustine adapts the Frank Pauline contradiction between what he wants and what he does, he sees in it the contradiction between the rational will, the place of consent, and the concupiscence of the flesh, which is reduced to sensibility. From then on, from then on, the contradiction is no longer between the will and doing, as in Paul, but between free will and concupiscence. Even when he has received grace, man remains prey to conflicts between the flesh and the spirit. Even a saint like Paul is not spared by this torture of powerlessness. From now on, the righteous person is no longer the one who is constantly virtuous, but the one who, tortured by lust, implores divine grace. To understand this radical shift, we must mention the scale of moral degrees Augustine established while explaining some propositions of Paul. I quote, let us distinguish then these four degrees of man, before the law, under the law, under grace, in peace. Before the law, we follow the concupiscence of the flesh. Under the law, we are led by it. Under grace, we do not follow it. We are not led by it. In peace, there is no concupiscence of the flesh. Here, Augustine sets up a table of correspondence that will serve as a framework for all his moral thought. A correspondence between four degrees of morality, four stages of salvation history, and four ways of relating to covetousness, that is, four degrees of freedom. First, under the law, man is subject to covetousness. He does not even try to fight against it, and he takes pleasure in it. This is what Aristotle calls vice. Two, under the law, man knows the good, he approves it, but he gives in to concupiscence. This is acrasia, the powerlessness of the philosophers. Three, under grace, Man still experiences concupiscence, but he fights it and forces himself to act well. This is the enkrateia of the philosophers, continence. For, in peace, there will be no more conflict, no more concupiscence, because we will know the good, we will love it, and we will accomplish it. This is the definition of virtue. This table of correspondence has four important consequences, which are very effective against Pelagius. One, the Jewish people under the law are doomed to powerlessness, unable to act well. Two, like Paul himself, Christians under grace can act well. They can overcome their concupiscence, but never suppress it. Three, it is original sin which makes man powerless before the law and prey to concupiscence under grace. Four, the tranquility of the virtuous soul, that which desires what it, what it does and does what it desires, is sent back to the hereafter. What is at stake here is quite simply the existential possibility of a virtue ethic, of a peace that is not disturbed by the passions. For Augustine, it is no longer accessible here below. Between the virtuosos and the multitude, between the virtue of an elite and a grace for all, Augustine made his choice. For the absolute primacy of grace, and against the elitist ethics of the Pelagians. From this point of view, since Paul no longer speaks for the Jew under the law, the relationship to Judaism changes in meaning. According to Augustine, it is not, as you think, any Jew, but it is the Apostle Paul who says in himself, I see in my members another law struggling against the law of my mind. Thus, 
Paul is kept in the anguish of temptation, and vice versa, Judaism is referred to the impossibility of acting well. Luther takes up Augustine's interpre interpretation, but he, re he reads it according to the questioning of the late Middle Ages. How, even by living as a blameless monk, can one be redeemed from original sin? Augustine's response to Pelagius, the praise of grace of the works, became in Luther's case, penance and justification by faith over the accumulation of good works. But was this really Paul's question? I come to my second point, a collective eye. To recover the Pauline enigma, we must first destroy Augustine's interpretation, which, which rests on three pillars. Romans 3 means that the era of Christian faith replaces the era of the law. Romans 5 means that man is subject to concupiscence because of original sin. And Romans 7 means, starting from the anti-Pelagian anti writings, that the description of powerlessness refers to Paul himself, so that this contradiction still applies to man under grace. I will return to the question of original sin in the next lecture. Today, we must stick to the last point. Is the autobiographical interpretation of Romans 7 defensible? Should we see in Paul the guilty, introspective, tortured conscience of the West? Ironically, it was precisely a Lutheran bishop, Christus Stendhal, who first answered this question. Stendhal showed that, on the contrary, when Paul speaks of, him, speaks of himself, we are far from the torment that is attributed to him. Philippians 1.20 proclaim, I have the assurance and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything. In Philippians 3.6, he declares himself blameless in the righteousness which is according to the law. Every time he invokes his conscience, it is a good conscience. 1 Corinthians 4, my conscience does not reproach me. Romans 9, my conscience bears me witness, etc. Paul thus presents himself as a model of moral behavior. Be my imitators, he says. We must therefore pl place his analysis of powerlessness in its full context. In the epistle to the Romans, Paul meditates on the promise made to the Jewish people. He reflects on the mutation he has supported. Gentiles can convert to the Messiah without going through the Jewish law. He must, therefore, think together three ideas, three theses. One, the Messiah is the only way to salvation which is reached by faith. Two, he fulfills the promise made to the Jewish people. Three, the Gentiles, the Gentiles also have a share in this salvation. In this context, the text of Romans 7 represents the tragedy of man unable to do good, divided between will and action. This inner dissension was already described in ancient poetry. It was embodied by the, in the tragic figure of Medea, the magician, split between her reason and the passion, and the passion that leads her to slit her children's throats. Paul thus recalls a tragic phenomenon with no way out. He shows that it is reproduced in the existence of the, belie of the believer. He approves the law of God, but he feels powerless to execute it. Where does this contradiction come from? Paul explains it in the first three chapters of the epistle. Both Judeans and non-Judeans have known God 
but both have sinned. The, pa the pagans have gone astray, they practice idolatry. But the Judeans are in no better position. They glory in having received the law, which indicates the good to them, yet they fail to fulfill it. For what is important is precisely to do good, to fulfill the works of the law, but both Judeans and Greeks are unable to do so. Therefore, their positions become interchangeable. I quote Romans 2. Circumcision is useful, it is true, if you keep the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision becomes an uncircumcision. If the uncircumcised man keeps the commandments of the law, will not his uncircumcision be circumcision? So their positions are interchangeable. All fail to do good. All are guilty. In the face of the salvation by the Messiah, Judeans and Greeks are equal. The point of the argument is the failure of the Judeans to fulfill the law of God, not the Acrasia. Paul locks them into the same powerlessness as the Gentiles. The, th the thrust of Paul's argument is not to emphasize man's guilt so that he begs for divine forgiveness. Indeed, the word forgiveness is not present in the epistles attributed to Paul with any certainty. But it is, the, the argument is to urge the, the Judeans and the Greeks to adhere to the Messiah, for it is through him that they will be justified. This adherence is faith. Moreover, the Augustinian opposition between faith and works is not exactly Pauline. In fact, Paul contrasts two kinds of operations, the works of the law with the righteousness of faith. For example, Galatians 2, Romans 3, Philippians 3. For The problem is not that good works without grace do not give merit, as Augustine say, states, or do not justify, as Luther will say. The problem is simply that man cannot fulfill good works. Contrary to what Augustine and Luther think, the authentic Pauline epistles do not directly oppose faith to works, but the works of the law to the salvation by faith in Jesus, Messiah. The reference to the law and the Messiah is essential. Paul's problem is to articulate the powerlessness of the law to save and the need to adhere for, to the Messiah, and at the same time to associate the Greeks with the Judeans. For even if both are justified by adherence to the Messiah, there remains a difference. The Judeans have received the word of God, the law, and this privilege is not revoked by their disobedience, chapter 3. For them, salvation through the Messiah becomes paradoxical, Romans 3, 20, 21. Now the righteousness of God has been manifested through the law. I'm sorry, now the righteousness of God has been manifested without the law, while the law and the prophets testify to it. This was already uh, expressed in Galatians 3.24. The law became our pedagogue to lead us to the Messiah so that we might be justified by faith. But in the expression, our pedagogue, who says our, who says us? Once the Christian identity is acquired in Augustine and Luther, we, us, will be understood as the Christians. The law will no longer lead to the Messiah. It will form man while waiting for the Messiah. It will be provisional, pedagogical in the modern sense. sense. But we have seen that such an interpretation of the messianic expectation is erroneous. So is the interpretation of the law as a provisional outline. For Paul, 
Judeans, Judaio, and Gentile converts are contemporaries. But when one has repressed the idea that Paul is a Jew, Judeans and Gentile converts will appear as two successive stages. In Luther's case, this even becomes a negative pedagogy. The Pauline idea that Gentiles do not need to go through the law in order to reach the Messiah is transformed into the idea that all men reach Christ by an accusation of the law and its unsatiable demand for justice. No one can attain justification unless his self-justification has been destroyed by the law, which makes his sin known to him. But clearly, according to Paul, those who say we are the Judeans, and he himself is one of them. Once justification by the Messiah has been achieved, the Judeans understand in retrospect that the law has kept them, that, that it has led them by the hand to the school of the Messiah. This is the original meaning of Pythagogos. As for the pagans, they had no pedagogue who could have led them to the Messiah since they ignored the law. But then Paul has to answer a question. Why was the law which came from God not effective? Is it cursed? Certainly not. We must at the same time give an account of the law and of those who do not pass through it. I quote uh, chapter 7, verse 13. Uh, has what is good then become death to me? Let it not be so. But it is sin. In order that it might manifest itself as sin, it fulfilled death in me by means of that which is good, in order that sin might become sinful to the utmost by means of the commandment. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold to sin. The Torah is, first of all, the word of God. And God's word does what it says. God creates the world and its inhabitants intend performative words which fulfill what they say. And he recreates them again in 10 words, the 10 commandments. But because of man's sin, this word no longer does what it means. The law tells man what to do, <clears throat> but it does not allow him to do it. It reaches man as a deactivated word, which is no longer performative. Moreover, resistance to God is personified. It is sin that acts, that works in man, that becomes itself a sinner. But it only manifests itself as evil through what is good, through the Torah. For the law manifests the truth of evil. It reveals that man transgresses it. It is not the law that has failed. It is man who has faltered. But Paul does not say man. He says I. Why does he do that? Is it an autobiographical I, as the later Augustine and Luther believe? His aim is not to propose a new philosophical analysis of Acrasia, to show the permanence of concupiscence in the baptized, or to sketch a phenomenology of guilty conscience. His aim is to explain both that the law is valid for Judeans and that there is no reason to impose it on pagans. The way to do this it to, is to show the deactivation of the law. The law is not performative. It does not allow access to salvation. It only makes the victory of sin more evident and it obliges man to turn to the justice that comes from Jesus Messiah. But then, what about the old way of earning salvation, which was the law? And what difference is there in this respect between Judeans and Gentiles? He, hence, our text 
serves as a crucial argument between a, a question and its answer. The question, is the law sinful? 7.7. .7. And its answer, the law is holy, is holy and the commandment is holy, just and good. Between the two, we have this passage in the first person. Now, this passage belongs to the literary genre of the diatribe, diatribe a vehement exhortation to, this, to the disciple to turn away from his alienated life and turn back to wisdom. The diatribe is characterized by abrupt shifts from one person to another. And here, the, the I who speaks is a rhetorical I into which all readers can slip. If we understand that Paul speaks in the name of the Gentiles who have been converted to the new faith and who would absolutely like to conform to the demands of the law, the text becomes enlightening. Paul cannot accept this attitude because it would go against his, own, his whole mission as an apostle. Indeed, Paul writes, I lived in the past when I was without the law, but when the commandment came, sin came to life and I died. Now, he who lived uh, before the law cannot be the speaker, Paul. It represents the converts. The one who died is not the individual Paul. It represents the converts. Powerlessness to act well is not a psychological curse, a weakness of the will. It is a characterization of every man under the law, whether he comes from the Judean people or wants to submit to it by conversion. On this point, the Pelagians are right against Augustine, and this powerlessness appears only in retrospect from the experience of faith in the Messiah. That man is incapable of doing what his reasons tell him, tells him best <coughs> is a phenomenon well known at the time. It is some, um, Ovid summed it up in a famous formula, video meliora proboque, I see better things and approve them and I pursue the worse. But, but first of all, Paul does not develop, develop a philosophical anthropology. He asks again, why? What makes the will powerless? Secondly, the self of which he speaks does not occupy the same place. Paul is careful to distinguish the I from the principle of sin. Uh, I quote 7.7. .7. Point 17. It is no longer I, ego, that fulfills this, but it is sin that dwells in me and hemoid. This not me in me has another name. Paul calls it the flesh. In the man who has failed, it is the flesh that acts, not the spirit. What Paul describes is not so much a powerlessness of the will as a dispossession, an external power has burst into him. This is why the, ex, the event ex, escapes him. I do not know what I am doing. It is no longer I who dwells in me, but sin, which has manifested it itself as a sinner. It acts as a quasi-person. The dispossessed self is haunted, inhabited by another. But far from making the ego feel guilty, this dispossession amounts to acquitting it, for the ego has nothing to do with it. Paul says, I, ego, serve the law, the law of God, and I take pleasure in the law of God according to the inner man, which is undoubtedly the true self. So the self is not, as in the doctrines of, the, of free will, a self-controlled faculty questioning is its failings. It is a haunted being, powerless against the force of sin embedded in it, or in him. 
from the moment when the reader no longer sees that Paul speaks in the name of Judaism or of the convert who wants to comply with the Jewish law, from the moment when he slips his Christian identity under the identity of the one who says I, he can only dodge the heart of the problem, which is the relationship of Judaism to the Messiah. I come to my third point, the grace of the law. The traditional interpretation of Paul as going beyond Judean legalism is a misunderstanding of Paul. But it is also a misunderstanding of first century Judaism. This has been shown by some recent, by some recent historical work, which constitutes the new perspective on Paul. James Dunn, who is behind this new perspective on Paul, quotes a revealing text. I quote, For me, if I stumble, the mercies of God will be my eternal salvation. If I stumble because of the sin of the flesh, my justification will be through the righteousness of God, which endures forever. He will draw me to himself by his grace, and by his mercy, he will bring about my justification. End of quotation. Here, the author recognizes the impossibility of fulfilling the law and the sinfulness of all men. Justification appears to him as the fruit of God's grace and mercy. This is a very Pauline text. But who wrote it? It is not Paul. This text comes from the community of Qumran. It is proof that first century Judaism knew salvation by grace. Indeed, as N. Sanders has shown, Jewish, Jewish faith is not legalism, but a covenantal gnomism. It is necessary to articulate the way in which one enters a religion and the way in which one remains in it. Entry in the covenant comes from a divine act of electing the Jewish people. The Jewish people entered by the grace of God who chooses his people. And each faithful person enters in turn in the same way. But in order to remain in it, the law must be observed. Believers maintain this covenant by fulfilling the commandments of, the God, of God. The law of Moses does not aim at acquiring salvation, but at keeping it. The believer is, therefore, saved by God's grace, but then he must follow his ways and fulfill his law. So, Paul's faith is in perfect continuity with this interpretation. One enters the assembly of believers by faith, that is, by the mercy of God who calls. But once in the community, the believer must conform to the law. As we shall see, Paul does not call for the observance of the law in all its details, but for what is essential, namely charity. Structurally, between first century Judaism and Paul, there is more continuity than rupture. One is saved by grace, and one remains saved by the works according to the law. Paul did not overthrow legalism because Judaism is not legalism, nor is it justification by works. And beyond com continuity, the real difference is obviously whether or not one accepts Jesus as the Messiah. But is the gospel the fulfillment of the religion of a people or a radically new universal event offered to all humanity. The law also has a social function, that of separating the Junian people from other nations. As the letter of Aristius reminds us, I quote, the lawgiver has surrounded us with an unbroken fence and iron walls to prevent the slightest promiscuity with all other peoples. Later, the Talmud will call for hedging in 
the words of the Torah. Paul's teaching on justification invites us to go beyond the exclusivity of the law, not, the, not beyond the law itself. The Messiah has broken down the wall of separation between the Jewish people and others. In the account of his conflict with Peter, Paul insists that Peter was forcing the Gentiles to Judaize because he was separating himself. Those who seek to establish their own righteousness, Romans, 12, Romans 10, excuse me, are not those who boast of their moral elevation due to the demands of the Torah, but those who want to maintain an ethnic status based on the possession of the Torah as a people's prerogative. But Paul puts an end to this logic of exclusion. If he opposes justification by faith in Jesus Messiah to the works of the law, Galatians 2, it is because the Judeans see these works as indispensable actions needed in order to remain members of the covenant and necessary in order to differentiate themselves from the pagans. By refusing to reduce justification to the works of the law, Paul extends it to all those who adhere to the Messiah Jesus. For Paul, the law is positive, but it is not a totem. If everything is to disappear, believers can keep their forms of life, their practices and rituals, but it is not appropriate for them to cling to them as an absolute. This does not mean that Paul abolishes the law, but rather that he puts an end to its excluding function, because the salvation of the Messiah has broken down the barrier between the Judeans and the, and the Gentiles. Through faith, the Messiah fulfills the law. Uh, Galatians 2, through the law, I died to the law that I might live to God. He completes it not to put an end to it, but to bring it to fulfillment. Of course, it is a question of universality. But the election of the Jewish people is not abolished. The promise made to them is not deactivated. If there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free man, if there is no longer man and woman, it is not in the name of an abstract universalism, but, I quote Galatians 3, because you are all one in the Messiah Jesus. Messianic universality is not the, the universalism of the Enlightenment. Therefore, the core of Paul's thinking, the idea that justification comes from God's initiative alone, is very much in line with that of the first century Judeans. We cannot forget that the key word in Paul the one that sums up for Augustine the opposition between Judaism and Christianity is actually a quotation from the Hebrew Bible from Habakkuk. I quote, the righteous will, the righteous will live by his faithfulness. In Paul's view, justification by faith is not directed against works, as in, as in the later Augustine, but means instead that Gentiles too are true hers of the promises made by the God of Israel. I come to my fourth point, law and charity. It is clear that for Paul, salvation comes by grace. Salvation comes from God through the Messiah Jesus, and no one can act in such a way as to earn it. But then the Torah does not apply to the Greeks who come directly to faith in Christ, at least as far as dietary prohibitions and marking by circumcision are concerned. That is, behaviors that imply ethnic separation. If one believes in the Messiah Jesus, no distinguishing mark is necessary. On the other hand, doing good, that is, the works of the law, must be fulfilled by all. Just as keeping the law implies an ethics, so the one who believes in the Messiah 
must perform works. But this new existential configuration gives a new meaning to his actions. The, Jude the Judeans will fulfill the works of the Torah, the Greeks the works of their conscience. To the Judeans, Paul says, it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Romans 2. And immediately afterwards, he adds for the Greeks, when nations that have no law do by nature the acts of the law, tatu nomu, without having a law, they, the nations, they are for themselves a law. Heo tu nomoi. They are their own law. They are autonomous. Heo tu nomoi in the literal sense. But Paul also responds to concrete problems. Should the Judeans cling to their ancestral customs or can they adopt certain Greek customs? Should they adhere to Jewish dietary requirements and circumcisions? <clears throat> and conversely, should they give up all ethical rules learned in the uh, Hellenistic world? To answer these questions, Paul sums up ethics in a nutshell. The whole law, the whole law is fulfilled in one word, Galatians 5, the love of the others as oneself. But we could call it a charismatic ethic. Action conforms to the charity that comes from faith, whereas charity does not act, uh, excuse me, whereas charity does not act, it is not authentic. Paul spares no effort to give the life of the new community, to guide the life of the new community, excuse me. He teaches its members that they are all different, but equal and complementary, Romans 12. From them on, from then on, it is charity that must govern the community, uniting believers with one another and guiding them in the commitment to the good. But charity does not stop at the limits of the community of believers. It invites them not to return evil for evil, but to bless those who persecute them and to be at peace with all men. It's in chapter 12. Here, Paul draws the consequences of the destruction of the wall of separation between Judeans and non-Judeans. The neighbor is no longer only the close relative, the member of the community. The believer will replace revenge with charity in action. If your enemy is hungry, give him food. If he is thirsty, give him drink, Romans 12. Charity that is not therefore a general feeling of love for humanity, but a series of concrete acts through which man, man puts himself at the service of the first comer, that is, of, of others. The development of, on charity in Romans 13 is framed by two remarks on the law. 13.8, uh, 13 do not owe anyone anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And at the end, love is the fullness of the law, pleroma, um, 13, uh, 10. Charity is therefore the law, but fulfilled. Fulfilling the law is first of all, performing it in act, but also bringing it to his incandescence, here we must get to the heart of the matter. Paul details some of the precepts. <clears throat> you shall not, for this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. End of quotation. The Decalogue has become the non-exclusive essence of the law. And even within the Decalogue, Paul has selected only the essential, four negative precepts, while leaving the reader to complete the list. These four prohibitions are those that relate to relationships with other men, not with God. 
this choice is significant. The commandments towards God that we do not see are only fulfilled by respecting the commandments towards man that we do see. Moreover, these commandments are quite universal precepts which have their equivalent in the ethics formulated by Greek philosophy. This is perhaps why Paul has amputated the object complement of covetousness. The precept, you shall not covet, could, could have been formulated by a Stoic. Now, according to Paul, these commandments can be summarized in a single, in a single one, which is the essential of the essential. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The relationship with others can be thought of, first of all, in the form of charity. It is by loving others that the believer fulfills his or her duties towards God in the law. But who is the other? Paul ident identifies him with, the, with his neighbor. Chapter 13, charity does no harm to the neighbor. Is the neighbor the relative? In Leviticus, the commandment concerned those who belong to the same community, therefore those close to them, the sons of Israel, who have obligation of, solidar of solidarity insofar as they participate in the same covenant. Here, the obligation extends, first of all, to all those who are grafted onto the same covenant, namely, Judeans and Greeks who have faith in Jesus Messiah. These are first of all, internal relationships within the new community. But moreover, by virtue of the principle of non-exclusion, this community has no ethnic limits. All can enter it, all can be targeted by this commandment. Hence, the extension to all. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, always pursue what is good, both towards one another and towards all. Charity follows an order. It first concerns the brothers in the community before turning to all men. Galatians 6, while we have time, let us do good to all, but first to those who could well in faith. And more generally, Romans 12, if possible, as far as you are concerned, be at peace with all men. A formula that is found as it is in the cosmopolitanism of the Stoics. But by going as far as loving your enemies, bless those who persecute you, Paul goes even further than Stoicism. Many interpreters since Augustine or Luther have argued that the gospel abolishes the law. Yet Paul proclaims the opposite. Do we deactivate the law by means of faith? Let it not be so. On the contrary, we establish the law, Romans 3. Giorgio Agamben feels compelled to explain that the law is not destroyed, but only deactivated, thus confirmed, as the exception confirms the rule. According to him, since Luther translate katarge, translates katargain as aufheben, heben wir then das Gesetz auf, so do we abolish the law? For this reason, we could see in this the Hegelian concept of Aufhebung, suppression and resumption at the same time. The law would be maintained and abolished at the same time, maintained in its abolition. Uh, quote Agamben, it is because it served to render the antinomic gesture of Pauline catargesis that the German verb took on this double meaning of which, says Hegel, the speculative thinker cannot but rejoice." End of quotation. But who said that this concept was antinomic? Who, if not the one who starts from a Christian theology, the one, the one who slips in a, dialectic, in a dialectical interpretation of Christianity as the negation and as an assumption of Judaism. In fact, it was Hegel who gave Aufhebung, Aufhebung this particular meaning. Because in Luther, in this passage, Aufhebung clearly means to abolish. 
shall we abolish the law? For the answer is unequivocal, the answer of Paul. Far from it, we establish the law. So we do not need to reintroduce a dialectic of the exception to the rule or to assert an affirmation in the negation. Paul says that the law is not abolished. So why do interpreters tend to relativize this passage? The problem is that after the disappearance of Judeo-Christianity, we live in a world that no longer observes the law and we attribute this transformation to Paul. Basically, Agamben, who is also situated in the hermeneutical horizon of Christianity, Agamben reads this text as a denial, as if at the very moment when he says the opposite, Paul accomplished an overcoming of the law. In reality, Paul really means that the law is not abolished, but that by charity, it is confirmed for the Judeans and fulfilled for the Greeks. Since the law is good, each commandment is good, and each detail is a form of the good that can be done to others. But if charity consists in doing good to one's neighbor, it contains all the good that can be done to others. As such, it is the fullness of the law. By practicing charity among brothers, the new believers fulfill the richness of the law given by God to the Jewish people. Charity does not stand against the Torah. It fulfills it. I come to my conclusion. We had to rediscover Paul's thought beyond the distortions that philosophy has inflicted on it. It is not what I want, the good that I do, but what I do not want, the evil I do. Paul's problem is therefore that no one, uh, I'm sure, is therefore not one of free will. For Paul, the will wants the good, it commands, but the body does not obey because an evil power interferes. And yet, in expressing himself in this way, Paul is not tortured by his own powerlessness and guilt. For this reference to Acrasia is intended to emphasize that the Judeans are in the same boat as the Gentiles, although they have the advantage of knowing the law which points to the good, they also fail to fulfill it. To both, Paul's, Paul proposes a turn to the Messiah by faith. Paul's originality lies in the fact that the Gentiles do not need to submit to the Jewish law in order to reach fulfillment. Instead, both must fulfill what is good, that is, what the law for the Jews and conscience for the Gentiles dictate. The new believers are not doomed to a permanent battle against lust, as Augustine thinks. There is therefore room for all the degrees of a good life here below, definitively acquired by the Messiah, and yet still to be fulfilled. Paul does not oppose faith and works either, but righteousness can only be achieved by faith. One enters into the new faith through divine mercy, one remains there by fulfilling the good, the works of the law, even without the law, in charity. Thank you very much. <laughs>